So we want to start now? No, no, no. But just so you know what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go through the, the materials. Well, I mean, we all go through the materials and tell me where you have questions. So I can try to answer your questions rather than reteaching. Well, you all had problems or questions on what? Trust. Trust. <laughs> you know what I think in US? I guess well, that's what I, I, I told them. I don't know why you all went so heavy in the US. Oh, look, you don't need it then. No, I get I mean, I No, no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't write the test. We need it. I don't know. I don't know what, what you need. You need it because it is this book. You need whatever it takes to pass the test. <laughs> I guess most of the questions just to focus on trust. Whatever it is. I mean, I. I can I can answer them all. Uh, you just said the US taxation is so convoluted. Well, it is. It's convoluted. No, absolutely. It seems to you are right. Else's, which is a bit more <laughs> so, hey, hey, Michelle. What did you say? Everything good? Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, my eyes are off the air. Yeah. But they report them. Hey, is it driving? Hey, is it driving? Does he talk low anyway? He talks really low. Yeah. He is very bad in the But then he has his own notes. He has something. I gave you the choice. I gave you the choice. No, I'll take the 18. I'll take it. It ain't too bad. I didn't even know you were doing it. Let me just not forget about that. Instead of paying $5 for this, I'll say pay $5.50. They okay? Ain't no problem. My only problem is when I made them and we stopped the import tax. How much VAT will go to? Go through and see what And the question is accountability. Why is it that they ain't a VAT when you want to buy that? That's my problem. What would you say? What would the rate be once the import taxes have been reduced or eliminated? How far are you thinking? Right. Right. It's all right. Stop. You good? Ah. You know, when I was in, I, I just came back from Athens, Greece. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. the, the, the fat is in Athens? 23%. It's much higher on the left. But tell me, percent But they're paying income tax. And they got income tax on top of that. Yeah. yeah. And they still have austerity measures. Yeah, and they still and they, and they still got no money. Right, so <laughs> hello. <laughs> so that ain't no encouraging no. sign. No, not at all. Because then, <laughs> but the thing about it is, we're paying income, and the people are still yeah. taking their money out of Greece. They're still not leaving their money in Greece. Yeah. I mean, and that that was the question I asked Mr. Lee. You know, you're saying you know we're like 19 percent in terms of the total tax average, and every and we're trying to get like the rest of the world, but the rest of the world yeah. broke. <laughs> Even though we, we still want the Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> uh, but that, but, the, but those are those are useless, useless um, pieces of legislation. Is there education you, better? You really think so? Or is there education better? Have you ever seen any any? Have you seen what comes back say the United States under their Freedom of Information Act? Everything on everything blacked out. So, so yeah, it's all right. Because mm -hmm. the government only says. Yeah, I, don't, I, I support it because you're not going to really get anything from it anyway. Well, I mean, you remember now, people we're just want a comfort to know that you're taxing us. No problem. Uh, we want to know where you're putting no. this money. We want to know the bidding you process. We need all of that. budget every year. But the budget tells you how the money's spent. 
<clears throat> they compressed up. They're not going to them going. Very wide. You have to follow it. You won't get financial clearance for spam. Yeah. Shit. Right. You serious? Dead and serious. also what the one in the money that you don't get. Serious. Ministry finance. Are you sure? Because I'm in the middle. Because I'm in the middle. You would know it anyway. For some reason, I'm not guessing this. I'm not guessing this. I'm not guessing this. Two months into school, they seem to be broke again and nothing done. Because they only release it quarterly. So you get quarterly at the you get a quarterly allocation, right? So if you have $100 million in your budget, right? That means every quarter, you're gonna get 25 million released, right? Okay. Then there's a 10% holdback. So you got $2.5 million holdbacks. So now really you only have 22.5 million to work with a budget of 25 million okay. because they held that, okay. right? Oh, quarterly, all right. Why do you want another? Why so you no, in cases for contingencies and stuff, okay. right? So, so coming down, you now need to spend 50 million you didn't budget for on a radar for the airport, mm -hmm. right? Or you need to, or you need to fix North Luther Airport because the FAA is going to close it down. That's another 40 million, right? You didn't budget okay. for. So all the whole back goes to those types of expenses. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can't overspend your budget because then you have to go back to Parliament by law. No, by law, you can't overspend your budget. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward, you know. I mean, it's not as cloak and dagger as it's in this. <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. It really isn't. Now, if I have, if I have a hundred thousand dollars in what's called, let's say, development contracts, right? In my budget, this is what people get upset about: development contracts. Development contracts are yeah. effectively, yeah, that's what you know, saying. contracts for consultants or contracts for projects and stuff that's really in the discretion of the minister, right? Um, people want to know how you break down that hundred thousand dollars, right? But look, you go to your CEO and ask him how he breaks down his little portion of his budget in his department. No. I don't. So when you put somebody in charge to run, yeah, no, you don't. The CEO ain't getting my money. Yeah. Huh? If you're a shareholder, you money. If you're a shareholder, I'm not a shareholder. But the shareholders, the government is using my money. The government is using my money. The at the end of the day. Not, not, not like that. Not right. Like that but, but, but see, with government, all you get is more money to pay. But the budget is rather transparent. No, no, no. no. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It's absolutely <laughs> I want to see the contracts. I want to see that. I want to see the bidding process. I want to see who get it and how. Well, you know. Uh, and, and, I want, and you want no related no, to who? I don't care about the budget. I, I want to see what the land inside the budget. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes. You want to know the related I parties as well. I want to see why. I want to see why. And you're going to see improvement. I want to see the situation. They go from single occupancy. Now all of a sudden say, you know what? Now let's just. Put this back and maybe you can do double occupancy. So what? <laughs> uh, why this person need insurance? I will, why this person need insurance? And, why, and let me see all the contracts who don't have insurance. Now all of a sudden, six weeks later, they have insurance. Or do they? That's what I want. I want to see that. They should have insurance. They should. I agree. That's a big word. <laughs> I wouldn't endorse not abiding by a contract you sign. Yeah. But this is what happened. <laughs> I mean, this never endorsed doing that. Yeah. Well, like, you should pay. So you know. And you should pay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, enough about corporate governance. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start on taxation. Um, That's we, have, we have, what, four modules? But we are taxation. I want tax. That's how we pay for them. We're going to talk about that when we come back. <laughs> we, have, we have four modules, right? Um, yeah. 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 I think what we should do is we should just just go through the materials, or just just if anybody's got any questions that they don't understand, rather than reteaching the whole four modules. Do we need to go through module one? Now, do we need to go through module one? Anybody got any questions? I thought my module was was rather clear. Yes, there's going to be three and four. If you have questions, you ask them. No problem. I can explain. Mister Pitt, I sent you a question. Would you stand in? Yeah, Ooh. Oh, Which question is this? Let me try to see if they put it on the high floor. What's the name again? Taylor Scotia Trust. Oh, you should put Scotia in there and say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor Scotia Trust. Yeah. 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 Y
Oh, you said noted. No, oh, that's not good. <laughs> 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 anyway, it was the most popular the government. Tell me what the government. Yeah. Scotia Trust? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the only question I got from you, I never got it. Oh <laughs> boy. Okay. No, the, the only name that comes up for you is is. I got one email from the bond. I mean, one that says the bond tail and says noted, sir, but that came from Wentz Farm. So you must have just been called. Okay. So what was the question? He was on his rent social media. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It was in reference to a legal thing that I was trying to wrap my mind around. Okay, no problem. Just, just go up. So do we have any questions on module one? No. That was the one that I taught. The fundamentals module. No questions on module one? You sure? Okay. You know, you know, I remember now. It's a graphic picture of how we can interpret the law. Okay. And there's this legal thing that you all do. No. You have to wait a lawyer's to see it by the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something in terms of the way they do it. It's trying to grasp it. So the canons of construction that's, and stuff? That's yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so so this is in module one. Judicial interpretation. Yeah. Class two. Page three. Page three. Yeah. And right? four. Okay, so the way laws work. Parliament creates laws, the judiciary the, interprets the laws that parliament creates. Right? So they interpret the language, they interpret how it's applied and in, in what situation and what set of facts. Um, that's what the judiciary does. The legislature just makes the laws and in certain instances makes the regulations. Um, People ask, what do the judiciary base their interpretation on, right? And this is where we talked about legislative history, um, when you have legislative committees, committee reports that are behind the law, that are in preparation for the law. So um, we, used, we used an example in the Bahamas, for instance, we don't necessarily have legislative history and committee reports in our legislature and everything. That, that predate the law, right? That, that, that explain the technical fundamentals of how the law is applied. But we use the example in the class about media and newspaper articles, right? And so if we have the VAT legislation, and we say, well then how did we get, remember the example? How did we get to 7.5% with no exemptions, right? When, the white paper that first came out in VAT had 15% and all these exemptions, right? All the breadbasket items, all the, the stuff. And if somebody's looking to interpret what's behind the law, and interpret where you got to here, what do they look at? Well, they'll look at the white paper, and they'll say, well, that's different. How do we get there? And then our version of how we got there, which is different than committee reports and the like, how do we get there? Rupert Roberts. Right? We got there because of Rupert Roberts. Because Rupert Roberts said that my business will be adversely impacted because half of my business are exempt items. But I'm going to be paying 15% on everything that I input, whether it's an exempt sale or not. And therefore, in reality, I'm paying 20, 25% VAT and only recouping 7% or whatever it is because I'm not charging VAT when you do it. That was his position, right? My margins are low. I'm overpaying on VAT because I have all these exemptions. 15% is not going to, you know, why don't you go with no exemptions in a lower rate? And everybody's treated you, right? So that's a version. That's how legislative history works. We don't really have it here, um, per se. 
Um, but that's an example of if we had legislative committees and we were calling witnesses on the legislation before we passed the legislation, and we called Rupert Roberts in to testify on his interpretation of the legislation, that's what would be in the committee report. Right? So our committee report is the Tribune and the Guardian, not always the punch. <laughs> so that's how the judiciary generally looks to interpret legislation and apply it to facts. And you know, again, our contributions in Parliament could be deemed as a version of legislative history or what the intent is of the legislation which helps you in interpret that legislation. Is that what the question kind of where you, you were at? No. So is there is do you guys have an actual document for the middle part? Yeah. It's called the trivia. The I mean, you guys. No. But how no. So, so what happened? Well, yes, but it's not public, right? Uh, we can't see that. It's, it's, right. it's, it's see, cabinet. That's free, that's no, it's freedom of information. Right there. No, it would never be public because, by, by constitution, cabinet minutes are not public documents; they're private documents, right? But when we decide this policy decision, right? When we decide in cabinet, right? Those decisions are minuted, and those decisions are concluded by a cabinet conclusion, right? Um, Did you pull 7.5 on a half? No, you, you run the numbers, right? So you run the numbers, and you say, if we take out all the exemptions, right, what will be the equal revenue? So if we say this right here is going to do 200 million, what's the rate here to do 200 million without exemptions? Right? So you do, you do your um, financial analysis, what it's going to take um, you know, to reverse the financial situation. And it's right, because if you read the recent IMF report, the IMF report said in 2016, right, the debt to GDP is going to start going down to be below 60%. And the government don't spend um, a lot more. Yeah. Well, it's based on projections, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> based on projections. And I'm praying and hoping that Mr. Percent doesn't mind those stuff rainbows. Yeah. Uh, the IMF has three-year projections. Stop <laughs> rainbows. So they're basing, their, they're basing their analysis on three-year projections. Yeah. And the new budget process, if you would look at the new budget, the new budget process is inclusive of three-year projections. Okay. So it's a little bit more transparent now, and if you go yeah. forward. Okay. Right. Any other questions on Module 1? Questions on module one? Module two, US taxation. I'm sure you have some questions on here. I, I looked at these, these slides. I thought it was rather heavy duty. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was rather rather heavy duty. So, um, so I'm happy to explain any questions you have on US taxation. I am a US tax lawyer, um, really the only one here. So I could probably answer these questions. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, factor can come under that, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, just as a principle of, um, is this solely U.S. Yeah, solely yeah. U.S. taxation? <laughs> so, so as a principle in the U.S which is overriding everything that we do uh, from a U.S. tax point of view, is that U.S. taxpayers right, are taxed on what's called worldwide income, wherever you are. That's an overriding principle. So if I'm a U.S. citizen and I'm in the Bahamas and I don't step foot in the U.S. one day of the year and I make a million dollars, that million dollars is subject to tax in the United States. Only citizen. Right. No, no, no. U.S. taxpayers. I, I, will, I will describe what a U.S. taxpayer is. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because um, what if they give up their green card? Okay, I'll explain what a U.S. taxpayer is. U.S. taxpayer. What's a U.S. taxpayer? Citizen. Oh, the passport. All right. Citizens are always U.S. taxpayers. 
Non-citizens are U.S. taxpayers. Generally, right? If I hold a green card, I'm a U.S. taxpayer, regardless of where I am, what I do, or anything. Right? You got a green card, you better be filing your tax returns. Or what's called the residency tests, right? Substantial presence. Did he talk about substantial presence? Yeah. Okay. Substantial presence. What does that mean? Six months. Hundred and eighty three days. In any given year, you are a U.S. taxpayer. I mean, even if I'm a Bayonian citizen going there for school. Well, most school, different, but schools different. whatever, medical. School is different. School is different, medical is different. Okay. And it's cumulative. I mean, as a spouse of somebody. You get exempt days if it's medical. Yeah. And is it it's cumulative? Okay. 183 days in one calendar year. Okay. Right? That's one test. The second test. Oh, that's one day. If you are there 30 days, right, but less than 183 days, you can still be a U.S. taxpayer. Do we know how? Uh, I, depending on if you're doing some activity. Do, did we go over the formula, the three-year formula to be a U.S. taxpayer? No. No. <laughs> no. I don't we went so. over these. This, we went over that, we went over that. But we didn't go over the last one. Okay. May not be on the test then, but you should know. Yeah. Okay? So, it's a three year formula. If you are more than 30 days and less than 183 days in any given year, that formula is the number of days in year one, right? Plus, one third of the number of days in year two plus one sixth of the number of days in year three. Okay? So let's say we were in the United States for 120 days for the last three years, each year, right? 120, 120, 120, right? How do you calculate that formula? 120 is number one. Uh-huh. And 40, 40 is number two. 20. <coughs> what does that add up to? 180. 180 is less than 183. Yep. Not a US taxpayer. So we just right? the numbers. So the default rule? <laughs> so use that. The default rule? is do not spend more than 121 days a year in the United States, and you will always be okay. You will always be okay. Gotcha. Right? 121. Because you will not reach 183 doing these numbers is 121. You do it as 122, you make 183. And you are a U.S. taxpayer. Right? So that's what we tell our clients. We tell our clients, especially the expats that move to the Bahamas and stuff, um, don't spend more than 121 days in the United States. Count your days. Count your days. You mean the ones who have given up their U.S. citizenship? Or the, or, or, or the ones who are never U.S. citizens. So, so if, I, if, I have yeah, a, I US. if I have a Brazilian client, right, who's moved to the Bahamas, you know them Brazilians always like to go to Miami, right? He's moved to the Bahamas. I tell them you have to count your days. You have to count your days. And be careful. Don't take that last Bahamas Air flight. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Stimmered Stim Stim one thing. Because if you do it to me at 12.01 a.m. That's a day. That's a day. <laughs> <laughs> Just use 115. Now, wait, 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 w
the fundamental rule of how U.S. tax works. Depends on how long you've had your green card. He probably didn't cover this yet either, but there's an eight-year rule with the green card, right? So, wow. Which means that if you have had your green card for more than eight years, you are considered for U.S. tax purposes when you're leaving as a U.S. citizen. <laughs> and then that's when the expatriation tax and reporting comes into play. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Wouldn't they waive the time frame? Yeah, well, well, the taxes well up to under the eight-year rule, right? If you've only had it for five years and you give it up, that doesn't that doesn't apply. No penalty tax, no penalty reporting. You just leave. So seven months, all right? Seven. So we always advise clients if you're gonna if you're gonna get a green card because you want to live in the U.S. but you're gonna leave and you know you're gonna leave. Leave before eight years. What if they leave after eight years? Then they have a penalty tax and, and reporting after. The penalty tax is all their worldwide assets. The gain is triggered, right? So if you had if you had bought a house years ago for a hundred dollars and it was now worth five hundred dollars, right? You wait after eight years, you have to pay tax on four hundred dollar gain without a realization event, which means you've got to come find the money. They haven't sold your house. They automatically have deemed it sold. Right? It's a pretty hefty penalty tax. Penalty tax and reporting one. And, and, and you have to report for 10 years. Oh, reporting for but 10 years. But after 10 years, years has passed, you're in the clear. Wow. Yeah. You assume, you assuming you pay your tax. Assuming you pay your tax up to that point. Assuming you pay and the, and the exit tax. And the exit tax. Okay. Right? So don't hold your green card for more than eight years. So, but the student, you said that it doesn't count. So if I work as a student in the United States? Work as a student, you have to pay the tax, but your days don't count because it's US source, right? It's okay. US source, so that's different. You're, just not, you're not taxed on worldwide. If you work at home on the, week, on the holidays and stuff, you're not taxed. But you are taxed on US source, okay. right? This is just the worldwide income tax tests to be a US taxpayer. Okay. Okay? Right. You fall into being a U.S. taxpayer, you are taxed on worldwide income. You are taxed U.S. taxpayer by citizenship, by green card, or by residence, substantial presence test. 183 days in one year, automatic. More than 30, less than 183, you have your three-year test. The default rule of your three-year test is you don't stay more than 121 days a year and you're in the clear. So if you get a question on the test, and it's a three-year rule, three-year tax rule, and no one year was more than 121 days, you automatically know he's not a U.S. taxpayer. You don't have to run the form, you don't have to do anything. Default rule, don't stay more than 121 days in any given year, you're in the clear. Okay? Well, I'm, whatever, when we go through the materials, whatever questions you have, I'll answer. I have a question as it relates to Fatka. Yeah. There's a Bahamian who was born in the Bahamas, uh, probably traveled once. No, he, sorry, he was born in the U.S. Both parents are Bahamians, right? He came, came back to the Bahamas, always worked in the Bahamas. Um, never, for the sake of what you just explained, never spend more than 120 days in the U.S. at any given point. Not, not a U.S. citizen. So even though he was born in the U.S., not a U.S. citizen. Not a U.S. passport. He has a U.S. passport. Um, is he born? To my knowledge, he doesn't have a U.S. passport. Depends either. on the year. But because he was born in the U.S., okay. he's, he's he's afraid that he might be subject to the FATCA regulations because he's born in the U.S. And technically, he is going to the U.S. citizenship by birth mm -hmm. exactly. altered in some years. Mm -hmm. If he falls into the year, a, a period in which he obtains U.S. citizenship automatically by being born in the U.S., he is subject to FACA. Now, it is FACA, FACA is not the responsibility of the citizen. FACA is the responsibility of the financial institution. <laughs> right? All banks. Financial institution has an obligation when they have it, when they get a client to look at his indicia. What does that mean? 
Look at his, where his passport's from. Look at where he was born. Look at where his phone number is. Look at where his address is. Look at all that, all the indicia of FATCA. And make a determination on whether they believe he's a US taxpayer or not. Right? But the minute he proposes a passport, no matter what the other indicia is, right? You're a US citizen. You're a taxpayer. So it's a financial institution that has the obligation under FATCA to make the determination on whether their client has enough U.S. indicia for them to report. Um, For a U.S. citizen, then they file U.S. and worldwide, or is it so? Yeah. Well, if you're a U.S. taxpayer, and you're you either you're a U.S. citizen or not, right? And you're working offshore, you're working abroad. Your tax return will be inclusive of worldwide income, but you will have a schedule on your return that shows foreign source income. Why? Because if it's compensation, wages, you get an exemption. I think it's $85,000, maybe $90,000. It's indexed for inflation. Yep. He covered that, right? And it's around $90,000 okay. um, for compensation income. Right? So which means that... So you're talking about U.S. taxpayer foreign so compensation income. You get an exclusion for the first. I think it's right right now. It's probably right around ninety thousand. Uh, we can get the exact amount, which means on the first ninety thousand, you don't have to pay income tax on, right? But there's a, it, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's a rather complex test because it incorporates if you're given housing by your employer, that's considered compensation. If you're given school fees by your employer, that's considered compensation. So they bring in all of those those benefits, employee benefit type of of items, to determine the compensation figure. Right? And then after the 90000 you have tax. Income at the same rate? Same rate. The 90000 is included to determine the rate. So you know the U.S. has proportionate rates, yeah. graduated rates. The 90000 is used to determine the total compensation to figure out what's rate scale you're in. Remember, that's comp. So if I'm getting rental income that is not included in the 90,000, I'm taxed on dollar one. I'm getting interest that's not included in compensation, I'm taxed on dollar one. Right? If I sell a piece of property, that's not compensation. It's capital gains. I'm taxed on that. No exclusion. Dollar one? Dollar one. Dollar one on the gain. No. I know there's some way to defer something. On the income that you get. On foreign source. Foreign source. Controlled foreign corporation rules? Uh I don't know. Okay. That's probably what 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 the issue is. Yeah, I, I saw so. I saw he spoke about I think so. Controlled foreign corporation. <laughs> yeah. Right? Can I erase the, the, the this, or you want this to stay? Sure. Okay. Foreign source, U.S. source. Last year, 
this, this, a lot of people were confused on the foreign source, U.S. source stuff. Right. Um, U.S. source, we know, is just, that's pretty easy, right? Everything's from the U.S. Foreign source usually depends on, the tax depends on the type of victim. When you say deferral, you're talking about the controlled foreign corporation regime, right? Which effectively says that if I'm a U.S. taxpayer and I own a offshore foreign company, right? When is that income deferred? Right? That income defer is deferred generally if you have operational income, which means not passive. You spoke about passive income, I'm sure. Rent, interest, royalties. Right? Those are all automatically included in income. But you get a deferral if you have operational offshore income. Right? And the deferral could be very valuable. Right? Very valuable. Why? Because it is, it is compounded growth. So if I make $100, right, my, ta my tax rate is 35% as a corporation in the United States. If I can't get deferral, what would be my tax on $100 of income? It would be $35, right? And my net would be $65, right? With no deferral. Yeah. And let's assume I have a 10% growth every year, right? Next year I'm making 110. 35% is 35, 38.50. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so my net income then that year is uh, sixty six fifty. Is that right? You go with that. Is that right? Okay. So that's my net income for two years. Right? If I have deferral, I get a hundred, I get hundred and ten, my net income and the aggregate is 210, 210, right? Versus 130, 150, right? So my real income is more, and if I'm going to invest that, I'm investing pre-tax dollars. So I have more to invest. Right here, if I wanted to grow, I only can invest 13150. If I wanted to grow, I could invest 210 with deferral. We see the impact of deferral. Now imagine that and investing that every year for 20 years, what the spread is, right? The difference. So deferral is a great feature. I don't have to pay taxes in the US on the income. And I could reinvest pre-tax dollars, which gives me compounded growth. I'm going to give you a real world example of this in a minute. <coughs> when do I have to pay tax on that? In two, in two instances. All right. so, cool. Two instances. When I bring it back to the US or when I sell the business. Right? Now imagine compounded growth for 20 years, what my tax bill is going to be. Almost 100%. I mean, enormous, because every year it's more tax and more tax and more tax and more tax and more tax. It's accruing, right? Let's use a real world example. Apple Computer, right? Apple Computer has tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars in cash outside the United States. Why? Because they've been deferring huge amount of sales for decades, right? So if you've been looking at Apple Computer and you know, Warren Buffett is one of the big investors now in Apple Computer and he's always saying, if you got so much money, return it to the shareholders. Stock buybacks, dividends, give us some more money, give us some more money, give us some more money. And Apple Computer's like, well, my money is offshore. 
How could I bring back money? You want me to pay all that tax? You won't have anything for me to give you because I'm giving it to the US government, mm -hmm. right? So what does Apple Computer do? Because this, they've made a bundle of money, they've expanded internationals, but now it's time to pay the piper, right? So what do they do? No, they, they, they borrow. Oh, yeah. They borrow in the United States to pay their shareholders. and use the borrowed funds to pay their shareholders. Yeah. Why? Because the interest is cheaper than paying the tax. <laughs> <laughs> the interest on the bonds that they have to issue to pay the shareholders is cheaper than paying the tax. And then people want to know how come U.S. businesses get so large offshore. Right? Let's bring it home. Templeton, right? So John was a U.S. citizen. Templeton is a U.S. headquartered institution, right? Templeton decided way back that all of his international business was going to flow through the Bahamas. So he set up the Bahamas as the international headquarters. How did Templeton grow internationally? through the compounded growth of Templeton Offshore and the Bahamas. It's true. That's what happened. So that's how compounding works. It has to be operational. If you're generating income, it's called FERC to income. If it's property, royalties, insurance, annuities, right? For FIRPTA, F I R P T A. Foreign interest, royalty, property, annuity, uh, trust. Uh, rent, rent, rent royalties, royalties. Okay. annuities. I think it may be transportation. Okay? That's how deferral works in an international context for U.S. companies and U.S. people. And deferral is only for companies and not individuals. Controlled, Controlled foreign regime. corporation. Right. Controlled foreign corporation means 50.1% owned by U.S. taxpayers. U.S. taxpayers that have are so people in this context, or U.S. persons. It's U.S. persons in this context. It's called U.S. persons. You have to have a 10% ownership to be considered a U.S. person. So if you keep all your U.S. people below 9%, below 10%, they don't fall into the CFC regime, which means that the passive income doesn't get repatriated. Keep your U.S. tax is under 50 percent. That means the passive income doesn't come back. Right? If you have that situation, then you try to structure it as an operational entity to take advantage of the deferral. But I'm just thinking it has to be beneficially owned by because I'm thinking that if I can go to the trust and and have the trust be my nominee shareholder. Did you do taxation of, of offshore trusts? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll keep that up. Let's, let's talk a little bit about trusts. Yeah. The United States deems every trust that is created by a U.S. taxpayer as a grantor, every foreign trust that is created by a U.S. taxpayer as a foreign grantor trust. Whether it's irrevocable or not, doesn't matter. As long as it's a foreign trust created by a U.S. taxpayer, it's a foreign grantor trust, completely transparent, as if it didn't exist. Look straight through it. So trust, so trust don't work in the context of that tax planning to block for CFC rules. Okay. <laughs> Talk in the context of trust about pre-immigration or no? 
the U.S. I won't go into it if you didn't find it. I mean, if it was on the syllabus. I don't know. I don't have I do not Taxation trusts. No. I don't recall that. Okay. So you have inheritance tax, inheritance tax. But before we get to the back of the syllabus, on U.S. Taxation Module 2. So that's the deferral question and how it works. Oh, my question. You yeah. said FATCA is not responsible for the individual, right? Oh, to report. Oh, for reporting. Oh. Reporting. Oh, okay. Because FATCA, FATCA is not a tax. FATCA is not a tax. FATCA is purely a reporting legislation, right? Because remember, if you are a U.S. taxpayer, you are always subject to tax, right? And tax reporting by the taxpayers is, is a voluntary action, right? Now, if, if you get penalized for not voluntarily filing tax returns. <laughs> but it's not voluntary, right? really. But you have to take the initiative to do it. Yeah. In fact, it is not a legislation that is a tax. In fact, it is a reporting legislation. Fact is there so the United States government knows whether you're taking the voluntary action of reporting or not. Governments of foreign countries. Governments of foreign countries are the facilitators. They're not the collectors. They're not the actual collectors. It is a financial institution obligation, right? The purpose of the government is only under an intergovernmental agreement. You learned about that, right? Model 1, Model 2, right? What is the Bahamas? One. Model 1. Reciprocal or non-reciprocal? Non-reciprocal. Non B, non-reciprocal, right? I negotiated this in the office. Uh, I, I went to Washington. I'm looking to see. I can't see that problem. I'm going to my signature on the agreement. <laughs> um, all the IGA does is permits the Bahamas government to collect the information, aggregate the information, and send it to the U.S. government. So we automatically send it, or is it by inquiry from the U.S. government? No, no, no. A packet is an automatic exchange regime. Mm -hmm. By request is the tax information exchange agreement regime. T is a by request. FATCA is automatic. So if I'm the U.S. government, right, I'm expecting the Bahamas government to send me information. And I'm expecting the Bahamas government will collect that information from the financial institutions, right? And if there is information con communicated to the U.S. government, and then the U.S. government says, just get on the They ain't filed on this. They commit tax evasion. How does the U.S. government now pursue that action? Not through fact. Tax information exchange. Oh, okay. And then they come back to the Bahamas government using the TIA for information on the request. The bottom way for financial institutions. Mm -hmm. But tell me, the financial institutions would only, I mean, they gather the information, so, right? So, yeah. So and the financial the institutions go through its indicia uh -huh. to figure out who is a U.S. taxpayer, mm -hmm. right? And then they communicate the U.S. taxpayer information, account information, to the Bahamas government. The Bahamas government aggregates all of that into a big spreadsheet, essentially, and, and, and transfers the spreadsheet to the U.S. government using the prescribed schema and the technical framework and all of that kind of stuff, right? They rolled out last weekend. Finally, tried. It's been slow since somebody left.
very small. <laughs> So then, with the T, it goes back to the government and it goes so back the to the TIA government. The request goes back to the Bahamas government. You have to fulfill the requirements of the TIA. It has to be specific, it has to identify the taxpayer, can't be a fishing expedition, all of that stuff. You still have to apply by that. It goes back to the Bahamas government. The Bahamas government evaluates the request to make sure it's consistent with the TIA requirements that, that are by treaty. And then the Bahamas government goes back to the financial institution. And that's done to the district of Finance. When you said that the U.S. Bat government comes back to meet the meet the requirements, specific and so forth, the Bahamas government would have already given us the information, right? Because so, so uh, no, the Bahamas government gives account information under FATCA. FATCA is about account information, right? Right. In order for me as the U.S. government to prosecute you. I have to know more about that. I gotta know if it's really tax evasion, or I gotta know if you're under the CFC regime. I gotta know if it's deferral or not. I gotta know what it is, right? I gotta know if you just stashed it aside under the bill. I mean, oh, well, so they're right? just giving you your name and, and, and to say you have name, account. account number, balance, highest balance for the year, okay. that type of stuff, not right? And if the U.S. government needs more information to build their case against you of tax evasion, they come back through the TIA. They only report those. <coughs> so there is a de minimis amount, fifty thousand a year. Fifty thousand. So just keep for twenty-nine thousand. So watch out for the interest to not go over fifty thousand. That's like leaving on the last plane of Bahamas Air. This is that we don't pay more interest, so. <laughs> So that that's that that will be how the factory regime works in practice. So effectively, this is on the U.S. level. We are moving towards a global automatic information exchange regime. And theoretically, whoever you have an IGA with on automatic exchange, you also need what? A TIA. Otherwise, they can't come back. What the reasons to the Bahamas government? Does it go like to different regulators or something? Like so how this is the how this part will work? Yeah. It is like a security online security. portal that the financial institution registers for, has the the, the schema or the essentially yeah. the, the, the prescribed spreadsheet template, fills in the information and uploads it into an online portal. Bahamas government then takes that upload, brings it down, <coughs> aggregates it, makes sure there's no errors in it, and then sends it on. So the only function of the Bahamas government is to bring it down, aggregate it, and check it for errors. Right. I mean for the TIA part. For the TIA, the TIA comes to the Bahamas government, yeah, and the regulators effectively will, okay. will pursue it. Okay. Any other factor questions? So it has to go to the Bahamas government before the regulator, or can they go directly to the regulator? Yeah, because the Bahamas government, the Ministry of Finance is always a competent authority and is the first point of contact. Okay. Question. For um, children that are born um, in the U.S., they're in the U.S. passport, right? Under the passport, let's say they, 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 they are wealthy. At the age of 18, they want to give up um, their passport or the citizenship. How would that work? You have, or what they'll tax. Well, you have an exit tax, right? And then you have a ongoing reporting obligation. So, mm -hmm. on, that same, on that same point, for anyone under 18, how does it work if they are, if they have a, a U.S.? Well, they're, they're Bahamian. Well, they probably. Can a minor own a bank account? Yes. Your minor on a bank account. How would that Can work? Can a minor own? Uh, it's just a hypothetically. Bank account. Just well, I know that the law, the parent, no, law, the parent, law, the the parent, parent is signing for them. The parent is right, the owner. but they're on the bank account. The so, so, the, so they have. They're, they're not. They're really not. They're no owner. They are beneficiary to the bank account once they can, they can have ownership of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but. Because I guess that was my point in terms of how the parents the owner until maturity. 
Okay, so it would be the parent. So, so if they have U.S. indicia, it really, it, it's really of no effect then, because so you have to go back to the parent. But at age 18, when they become a beneficiary, even with the Buddha Trust, then all of this will kick in. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it's for them to give it up before age 18. We'll tell you to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> and they ain't going to have a chance to that. Well, they won't. It depends on the money involved in the taxes. It depends on the money involved in the taxes. Now, would they look at the that. assets before they were 18, or would it go mm -hmm. effective the day that they're 18 and forward? Whenever you become vested. Is that 50k number? That's the that's the de minimis amount under fact. If you have less than 50,000 in the account, it won't be reported. It's just a, a threshold, a floor. Any time during the year. Don't hold 49,999 getting interest payment. <laughs> Well, You'd be safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, right. so the only no, problem is you're going to take fees and then it's going to reduce it again. Exactly. The bar you just said the bar from my right? Yeah, you're right. So, the F bar. That's the form you file for foreign bank accounts. Right? And you're right. You don't have to own it. If you sign on it, you have an obligation to report it in the U.S. government. Oh. Right? So I had a client. She worked for an offshore bank. She held a U.S. passport. She signed on all of the accounts of the offshore bank, hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Not a piece of it was hers. She was an employee. She had to disclose all of that bank account information to the U.S. government. I, know the was not US. I don't think she was working for that bank too much longer. No. That. Well, that was the bank's responsibility. They're supposed to know that. That's how not they the bank's work. responsibility. It's personal. No, but if they no, know that they the hire, no. What I'm no. saying is, if they know that they hire somebody that's a U.S. person, that's a business issue. Maybe yeah. she never told them. That she was U.S. Maybe she never told them. In that case. And that's a trend. That's why we remove right. them off. But the right. problem is the penalty is so large you know if you don't sign. You know We're in the F bar now. You know that anybody that's a U.S. taxpayer with a foreign account is very scared not to file it. Who's going to file it? Pardon me? Pardon me? Yeah, because it's just a file and it's just a report. Every year you have to file it. Yeah, we have to. And to okay. continue to file after that to be able to sell it. You know, they're, they're, but, but the problem with this client was she was signatory on her employer's account. So it was the employer's money that she was disclosing to the U.S. government. Like she had if she had third party authority, it would have to be clients too. You know how we have no money companies and you're signing the same thing? Same thing. As long as you sign. As long as you sign. What? Why do you What's think the when HSBC story? gets into their disclosure and they say they got 8.8 billion of Bahamas money in there. You heard that, right? Yeah. What's that right? You think that's really 8.8 billion dollars of Bahamian money? No, well, that's oh. Bahamian's nominee accounts. Nominee, nominee companies because as directors you have to give your passport so they register it as a Bahamas account. Right? That's what that is. Just lawyers. There's some rich payments, but you know, not that kind of place. That wasn't me. You don't think so? Not even close. Not even close. I know a couple of former politicians. Not even close. 8.8 billion? Yeah, I know. That's a lot of money. If you have a client that entered the That's John Gabriel. Okay. Yeah. And now pays every year. They're in good standings, right? Very they good. just have to complete their W-9. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And they're F-4s. I mean, they got to report it going forward. Yeah, comments to that. Yeah. The U.S. will check to see if they've been paying. So when you enter the, also, when you enter the voluntary disclosure program, you become a witness. Right? How do you think UBS got brought down in the U.S.? Right? Who becomes a witness? So, 
You mean the, the taxpayer? Company? Okay. So let me let me let me sh let me show you how UBS got bought down. All right. So the U.S. government says, man, all these U.S. people got money all over the place. I give them a voluntary disclosure program, right? Mm -hmm. They only gonna have to pay. You. For the first one, I think it was like five percent, right? Really cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. They're really cheap. So what they get? They got a whole bunch of people saying, I come and clean now. This cheap. Right? This for the U.S. government. Right? So you have the voluntary disclosure program. The client, right, now becomes a witness for the government, the U.S. government. Gives the U.S. government information, right? And the U.S. government gets enough information that says, man, these people in UBS, and actually, it's the reverse. These people are in Wedgeland, which was the affiliate, the, the, the other company affiliated them. Wedgeland was using UBS as a US correspondent bank. So let's do a John Doe subpoena on the US correspondent bank to get more information to find out what was going on. When I get more information, I get all the currency flows, the different accounts that it's going to, everything that's going on with US clients. And then I build my case and I have enough information to take down UBS, to take down Wedgelin, to get 2.8 billion from Credit Suisse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are the two outstanding John Doe subpoenas in the Baham in, in the region, I should say, which is inclusive of the Bahamas right now? RBC. No? No? Butterfield? Butterfield? CIBC. Uh, yeah. Two outstanding John Doe subpoenas, right? Yeah, that's awesome. What about Dominion Securities? That's not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's security. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Any other factor questions? Any U.S. tax questions? So, okay, so one, one question. So, once they are compliant after they come clean and go into the program, they are witnesses for the. Sound like you've been in the voluntary life. disclosure program. <laughs> It's on. The, it's on. It's on your voluntary disclosure. Uh, they will say. They'll say. Probably so long as they're investigating a, a, a matter that you're investigating. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody that enters the program is a witness. Potential witness. Potential witness. Because they make it. If they if they set up the CFC. They get it for it. If you look at if you look at the indictments, the UBS indictment and the Credit Suisse indictment, right? And you read them, they're online. You can get them from the Department of Justice. They will tell you this testimony was given by uh, uh, person one who entered the voluntary disclosure program. Spoke spoke about this. This testimony was given by witness two. U.S. tax questions? Was that the Deloitte one? No. This one here. Oh, how to calculate? 
Okay. Do we know the difference between credits and deductions? Let's start with that. I was about to say deductions. Just about it. Deductions. So we have income, right? Deductions. Credits. I need to know what all of those are. Right? Income is generally all taxable. So, tax exempt income is not if I have a, if I'm a charity. But taxable income is generally everything you make. Right? Deductions are subtracted from income. Right? Deductions are subtracted from income. Credits are subtracted from tax. That's the difference. Deductions come off of income, credits come off of tax. Which is more valuable? Credits. Credit is more valuable. Because it comes off of what you owe, not what you make. Right? Certain things are excluded from income. Right? And this is the schedule of exclusions. Child support payments. Quest, gifts, life insurance, proceeds. Right? So if I get a life insurance, if I make if I make a hundred thousand dollars in compensation, right? I have ten thousand dollars in gifts given to me. I have another hundred thousand dollars in life insurance proceeds, right? I have fifty thousand uh, dollars. Let's say from playing numbers. Numbers, <laughs> 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 right? What's my taxable income? Well, no, what's that? No, I thought life insurance was exemption. Right? Yeah, life insurance. $100,000 compensation, $10,000 is a gift received, $100,000 is life insurance proceeds, and $50,000 from paying numbers. $150,000. Why? Gifts are exempt. Life insurance is exempt. So my income, my gross income, is 260. My taxable income is 150. Right? The person who gives you the gift has to pay it. They're going to pay the tax? It's a gift tax. Gotcha. You'll go into gift and estate tax after. <coughs> so gift received. Gift received is, is excluded. Yeah. Right? They would have paid the tax when they acquired the gift by Donor pays the tax on gifts. Right. So, 150 taxable. Right? Now, likewise, I have. What are deductible expenses? Give me three deductible expenses mortgage, mortgage, mortgage interest, charity contributions, mortgage interest, charities. Contribution to register charities. In section 501 of the internal yeah. revenue. Yeah. Business expenses? Yeah. Certain, yeah. Legitimate qualifying business expenses. Okay? Okay, so let's say mortgage interest, I pay ten thousand dollars. Right? Charities I gave five thousand dollars. Business expense twenty thousand dollars. My deductions are twenty plus ten plus five, right? 35. So I remove my deductions. And now what is my taxable income? 150,000. 
So I went from receiving 260,000 to being taxable on 115,000, right? How could you go value My mortgage interest was $10,000 for the year. My charitable contributions to authorized and proper charities were $5,000 for the year. My business expenses were $20,000 for the year. That's why you see all them keeping their receipts for gas and everything in the States, right? Yeah. Those are all business expenses. All those are business expenses. Business meeting. Right. <laughs> so lunch is for business meeting, right? Those are all deductible expenses, right? 115000 right? So hence, that was the, remember the point of when you're buying clothes, just call it uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I don't have the rate schedules here, but, but whatever the rate schedule is now, let's say the rate schedule for that is 20%. Right? Let's say we're in the 20% bracket, even though that's about. Let's say we're in the 30% bracket. That's one of the right? What's my tax? I may use my calculator. Thirty-four five. Thirty-four five. Right. 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 Thirty-four five. Thirty-four five. So I deduct thirty-four thousand five hundred. I mean, I'm not deduct. I mean, I pay. I have thirty-four thousand five hundred in tax. Right. Now let's say before the program expires, so let's go back a couple of years, that I get, I buy a hybrid, well it was an electric car in the United States. And as part of that electric car program, I got a thousand dollar tax credit. Thousand dollar tax credit for buying an electric car. That's it. It's a, it's a federal government mandated program to Got encourage you to buy electric cars. Right. Where does that thousand dollars? What happens to that? Take it from the electric car. Take it from the tax. Take it from the tax. All right. You say that's it. Yep. You could turn that into a deduction. Right. That's equal to. My reverse math, right? What are you trying to do? A thousand is equal to how much in income deducted, right? At thirty by thirty percent tax rate, right? Several thousand dollars. So it's equal to a several thousand dollar deduction or one thousand dollar credit. The credits are always more valuable. So now you're thirty four to five hundred in tax, right? So you had a total compensation of two hundred sixty thousand paid thirty four thousand five hundred. We started at 34, 5, 1, 35. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I put the deal. My bad. So, what's my effective tax rate for the year? Uh, 33. Uh, my effective is always on gross, right? Okay. So 33,500 divided by 260, right? Oh. What's that percentage? 13%? 12 12.8. 12.8%. Effective is always on. Right. For the year. Now that will change because I may not, I might not get 100,000 life insurance next year. Okay. I put on gross. I put on gross. It's like my effective rate. So what do I pay on, on my total income? That's why when Warren Buffett says I have a lower effective rate than, than the secretary working in my, you've got all these deductions and credits and referrals and everything else, right? That's how it works. So effective rate over something. Income tax. Any other questions on income tax? Don't when we get that. Tax, gift and estate tax, 
A gives a gift to a hundred of a million dollars to B. Who gets tax? A. 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 Do you speak about the unified credit? I don't, uh, I don't recall. I missed the class. I think, you get, I think the number now is, I'll have to check, $5 million of a unified credit, which means that million dollars is deducted from $5 million. So you can give up to $5 million in a lifetime without paying for that. Okay. So something over the $5 million that you get tax. During lifetime. It's a lifetime pool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wait, what's there? Yeah, that's good. Okay. You can give up to five million. So, okay. so we know we know that the donor pays gift tax, and we know when you just you die, your estate pays a state tax, right? In the United States, you have a gift tax and a state tax. He didn't speak about this, I guess. So this may not be on your credit. Your, your test. You have what's called a unified credit. But then this would just might come under. I think it's under the, the trust. It could be under the trust. You have a unified trust. Oh, yeah. But I think they have the same thing. Same yeah. concept. She did. She did. She did. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure they have that. Yeah. I'm sure you spoke about gift and estate. What do you say? You didn't speak about gift and estate tax? Mm -hmm. Or inheritance tax? She did under trust. Yeah, but under trust. Yeah, she did under trust. Yeah, she did under Were they really trying to jack your... Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm glad you were... Well, fine. I had to recognize that before. <laughs> we realized that about four or five weeks ago. <laughs> Do they have a unified credit? They have an inheritance tax threshold. Right. Okay. Well, can you get me here? Yeah. 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 Page 35 of the trust section. Oh, yeah. I send you a little bit. 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 I most countries have a, let's call it a threshold, so we won't call it what the different countries call it. In the U.S. it's unified credit, it's inheritance tax threshold here, but they usually have a threshold. Let's just say it's $100, right? The U.S. side, they do it gift and estates tax. I don't know if they do a gift tax in the U.K., gift estate or inheritance tax. Yeah, I guess they do. During lifetime, in the US, and it looks like annually in the UK, you get no tax until you go over that threshold. Just like the 50,000 report into the factor, same type of principle, you have to go over the threshold to get it. And depending on the jurisdiction, it could be annual or it could be lifetime. Like I said, you see in the UK, it's only 325,000 pounds. Can you say pounds that way? Yeah. In the US, when that's annual, right? In the US, it's I think five million life. Right? So if you go over that, the donor who gives the gift pays the tax. Don't be that's why you don't pay tax when you receive it. Right? And the estate pays the tax on the worldwide worldwide value of the asterisk over the threshold. Worldwide assets. Worldwide assets. The value of your worldwide assets. Right. Questions on taxation? Or we want to spend the last half hour on trusts. Fine. Is this the only review class? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no more? <laughs> I was only asked to teach one. 
I, I just have a question on the CFC regime again, right? And you say if we, as, as a kind of like an underlying vehicle, it can't be a trust. Income tax, it can't income be a trust. The CFC cannot be a trust. Control foreign corporation. Oh, it has to. Okay, corporation. So let me, let me, for all of those who were paying attention last year to what was going on in Parliament. It was a lot of, we have to tell it this was active uh, do, you rec do, do you remember that? Yes. Investment condominium. Right? We passed this because of that in Brazil. They were looking to do CFC rules. No, most of our investment funds are formed as IBCs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most of our business from Brazil are investment funds, right? 60% of all the new funds licensed in the Bahamas are come from Brazil. Wow. 60. Speak Portuguese really fast now. 60%. I'm going back for the fourth time for the year next week. That's how much business there is in Brazil. Wow. 60% of new funds licensed in the Bahamas are from Brazil. Right. All formed as IBCs. What is an IBC? A foreign corporation for Brazilian purposes. Foreign corporation for any purposes. Right? So we have an investment fund, and there is no exclusion for investment funds in the CFC rules of, of um, Brazil, what does that mean? Not attractive. Not attractive. Why is it not attractive? Because under the current regime, funds in Brazil, offshore funds, operate on deferral. Right? Remember the deferral and the compounding and everything else? It works for funds in Brazil. Financial assets now, not operating companies, financial assets. Hmm, but it's compounded. I don't pay tax, I keep rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. Same principle. If CFC regime comes in, what's at risk? My deferral. Right, because they're financial assets. It's not operating business, remember? So it's going to bring all that back into real time taxation. So what do you do? You create an entity that is not a. A company. A company. What do we create? We create an investment condominium. A condominium is, this is a little off base, is a civil law concept that if you think about it, it's like a blend between a partnership, partnership. and unit trust. Proportionate ownership, non-corporate entity, liability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Used in Brazil, and recognize in Brazil as an effective, transparent, non-corporate entity for what? The deferral. So we take the condominium civil law concept and we put it in Bahamian law. Same thing, the thing we did for foundation. And these, right? Same type of principle. Same type of principle, put in Bahamian law. So now with the CFC rules coming to Brazil, we can convert every IBC to an icon preserve our advantage. Why? Because they want to defer. Right? So I don't know if that kind of puts the CFC concept. Who came up with that? Huh? I, 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 just, I just got to ask. That was my invention. Because <laughs> I figured it wasn't there before. But, but was. Legislation was passed in September. We put that whole piece, that whole product together nine months into the problem. I got, I got a question on it, but I lost it. So Brazil is the only market now? Brazil is where everything is the Brazil is the number one growth market for the right? Now, they already have an entity similar to that in Brazil. Condominium. So the only thing is? We mimicked, but it's, it's a civil law. So what's the benefit for them to come here? Well, what's going on in Brazil right now? You have inflation, you have devaluation of currency, you have a decreasing economy, you have uh, political uncertainty and unrest, right? You have, um, you have Petrobras, 
right? Corruption, yeah. mm -hmm. Corruption. Which, which creates unsettledness, Corruption. right? Yeah. Now, what is the so 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 what what do those who have made money in Brazil want to do? Sorry, to get their money out. We have a register for the icons. Yeah. Like on Brazil, you can register for your icons. It's right there with the bombs register. Right. 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 Just like Tommy. Just like Tommy. Mm -hmm. You pay a fee for that too? Mm -hmm. Just government. Whatever our company is, three something, whatever. Yeah. We, 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 we did. And IBC is only three fifty. Yeah, we did it. The foundation is five hundred. No, no, we did it. We did it after a company. We didn't we wanted it. We just oh, wanted it as a vehicle to switch companies out of. So I, that's why people want to get out. Everything in today's world, in financial services, is more about this stuff with tax planning, legitimate tax planning, than what we were before. Evolution. So we're the world today. I wouldn't thank Obama. I most thanks to Thank you, Right? So that's why. That's why they're trying to get out of this world. Because when they move their money out, they move it into what? Euros or US currency or Swiss francs, but not Brazilian reals. Why? Because currency is the iron. When I was in Brazil in January, it was 2.4. Rails, but that's what a dollar got you. When I went back in March, it was 3.3. Can an can an American can an American benefit with this icon? No. This is only beneficial to us as long as our currency stays stable. And after they're not doing the dollars. They're doing U.S. dollars, euros, or Swiss francs. No, most of them are doing U.S. dollar investments. But when you go, when they, if they're doing European stocks and stuff, they do it. It depends on where their investment profile is. So geopolitical and economic indicators is where growth is. Whenever you see uncertainty in the country, that's where you go. Right now it's Brazil. What's next? Russia. Mexico. Mexico? What's after Mexico? Russia. Mexico was on the up Colombia, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then Peru and Chile. So, in other words, we'd really need to speak Spanish. Russia. Peru. Russia. Latin America. You tried? You have one board of the Russian client? No. What? Oh, yeah, the Russian client. Very, very rich one. Nobody, you, you can't get proper KYC on this. I swear. I heard it. I heard it. You want your growth markets? Yeah. We'll learn Spanish. Just tell me, Michael, one and, question. And the Middle East, right? Because you did a campaign in the Middle East. You must yeah, usually go. Yeah, so far from the Middle East. They usually go to Switzerland. Yeah. Because it's not tax related or anything else. They just, they, they yeah. go to Switzerland. My question is, a client of Brazil who wants to bring his money is out there. It has to pass through the exchange in the central bank, right? Well, it is no. a, it's a central bank registration. Yeah. Right? But they, they, they only register what they're bringing out. So if they bring out 10 million, uh -huh. they just file a registration with the central bank, mm -hmm. right? And then they don't have to declare what it's worth. They get deferral, they get compound, that 10 million can turn into 30 million real quick, right? So they don't have to declare that until they bring the money back. So as far as the central bank is considering, they only had 10 million. Do they continue to tax them annually to say you should have 10 million or the fact that it's gone or it's no, gone? No, that's after tax dollars. Oh, okay. And Remember, it's this, gone, is all, it's gone. this is all the legitimate tax planning structure. And once it's gone, it's gone. It's, it's after tax dollars. Okay. That's already been declared. Okay. So the state that on that already. Okay. So the transfer out there not getting tax either. No, no, no. There's no exit tax that's that's right. Right. right now. It's all right. They've they men they mentioned it as a possibility. Okay. So 
wherever you see those features, that's where you the new markets are. What about Google? Google's a good market. Yeah. Pretty, Peru's kind of it's still pretty stable. Right. Mexico, Colombia, Peru. <laughs> what about uh, uh, Middle East? Venezuela has too much under us right now. Right? Can't get money out of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. All the Venezuelan money that you can manage is already out there. So you just got to go steal it from somebody. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, legally, legally. business. Right. Yeah. yeah. Commercial steel. You got to go on Brickle. All the money in Venezuela is on Brickle. In Miami. So go into Miami and you get it. But it's good that we go back to the fact that I've heard that Russian clients are right. Uh, what? Oh, what? It's a, legit, it's a very good market. It's a very good market. Very good market. You, know, you better go hire a company like Kroll or somebody to go do your background check. Mm -hmm. You can't do it in 10 hours. It's too hard. Right? It's too hard. No, no. We have Russian clients. I'm not going to tell you not to get the Russian clients. Mm -hmm. Do it the right way. Because you never know what you're getting, what you're doing, and who you're getting. Because, you know, the mayor of the cities. You know, first cousin, you know, second wife, sister, right? Owns the one billion dollar company, right? That is getting contracts from the mayor. That's money laundering. That's bombs here. That's money laundering. That's money laundering. Oh, they kill a couple of people. <laughs> and they, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta be careful in Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know? I know. Plenty of money in Russia. But it, it was Plenty of people in Russia trying to get the money out. Lobsters. Right? And there's legitimate money in Russia. No question about it. Oil? No question about it. You just gotta... <laughs> Don't be the one that got Putin's cousin as a client. There's so many in the age. All right. Heard. You heard it. Yeah. No question about it. Trusts. Any questions on trusts? We know what a trust is, right? We know how a trust is set up. We know how it operates and is administered, right? Now let's go over. <laughs> let's go over. I know it might keep you till two. Yep. Let's, let's go over it. Let's go over it. Yeah, let's go over it. Any other types of trust? Discretionary, no, non discretionary. Fat. Fat. You got to touch fat as well, right? You want to do that? You know, I want to do trust first. Let's go. What questions do you have on that? 10 and 10. You got 20 minutes. Ask the bad questions. We've been asked that question. Trust is more questions. I'll answer the bad questions. Go ahead with that. Give me the question. Trust. They don't have questions. You move on. No, no, we got no, no, questions. No, 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 discretionary, no, no, discretionary. Let's go to that. Any questions on that? We have to trust. Any questions no, on that? No, answer bad questions now. Yeah, there are no questions on that. I'm moving on to trust. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no questions on that. We understand that. Could you do a calculation for me, please? Calculation of that? Yeah. <laughs> you buy something for $100, what's the that? Seven dollars. Seven dollars. Okay. So that's on the consumer level. She wanted on the business level. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any questions on that? I buy something for a hundred dollars, right? Like right. That's my product, right? I buy it for a hundred dollars. I got. What do I pay him back? Oh, you're bringing it from the states. That's how you buy from the states. Yeah. Seven fifty. That's gross. Seven fifty, right? Let me see the chocolate tax. I got ten dollars on rent attributable to that product. What's my value? On rent. I got ten dollars on B C. Right? I got ten dollars on other operational expenses. So what's my tax now? Give me of that product. What is the what? What's the budget? Nine seventy-five. Is that right? Nine seventy-five. Nine 
Concepts. This is the equivalent of the settler. It's transparent. It's as if it didn't exist. It's attributable to the settler. Except for the United States, so we get stuff. Oh, that means all income is taxed straight to the settler. There's no blocker. Other countries, except the U.S. U.S. is different. This is a separate taxpayer. Right? So when we talk about, when I mentioned pre-immigration trust planning for those who are looking to go into the United States, I use that to shelter assets before they get taxed. You have a client who wants a trust but doesn't want to pay tax on it, but is staying in their home jurisdiction. They have to do other control. They have no reservation. From a tax point of view, it's transparent. It does nothing. It doesn't exist. If they retain the powers of the tribe. Right? Now, you can be creative and you can use a Bahamas executive entity that is a protector, right? and put the client on as one of the council, maybe have five members, client is one member, and make him the investment committee so he can manage the investments of the trust. Right? You do those types of things. Point your vote. 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 Because protector. Right? But he's a minority interest on the protector, so he doesn't have control of the protector. Right. He's doing investment advisory services only. He's advising the investment manager, who's the discretionary investment manager in the trust. So he doesn't have control over the investments. So if you are a good investment manager and like collecting your fees, you will generally follow the guidance of the advisor. 
So you can do some things where they, they know what's going on because they're on the protector and they can give directives as to what it should invest in, but they can't change the terms of the trust. And then in general, principles that as a separate taxpayer, and income is not issued to the I don't know. That's a fundamental part of the trust. Yeah, I was, I They're growing. Because these, these <laughs> irrevocable trusts are being used more and more today for legitimate, effective tax planning reasons than they were in the past. For trusts or trusts? No, for executive entities. Oh, oh, yeah. No register for trusts. No register for trusts. No register for trusts. So from a tax principle point of view, an overriding principle, yeah, that's the difference and that's usually how the plan is going on. And of course, the yeah. US government recognizes our executive yeah. 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 as, yeah. as a legal separate entity from investors yeah. and council members. No shareholders, no beneficiaries. Who are you going to trade us over? We get corn. Executive entities are sitting as entities generally. So an executive fund to protect their on top of investment advisor, executive, these types of things. Um, Some of is very expensive. Other questions? Well, for estate tax purposes, again, usually that is included in the state. This is excluded from state tax. Right? If you are a resident in a taxable country and a beneficiary of an irrevocable trust, then you get distributed money that is taxable. Right? And that's where the trustee has to report um, distributable net income when they distribute it. Right? So a trustee will have calculation obligations to assist the beneficiary in reporting his tax. You could have, the settler could have put in $100, right? And the corpus is now $200. $100 of that is capital, 100 of that is income. Generally, then, you would only have 50% tax, 50% uh, of the distribution would be tax. Because you're assuming you're getting out of proportionate interest in capital and income. Did she go that far? Um, we don't know how far she went. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a different way of the Yeah. Better, better or worse? It's simple. Yeah, I think it's well, go 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm a tax lawyer. She's what? She's a trust administrator. Yeah. <laughs> she just focuses on this. She just focuses on this UK tax, right? Yeah. right? I mean, yeah, UK, UK trust. The whole thing was UK, but that was UK. He was saying Yeah, he just. So all of these preliminary stuff on what is onshore, what is confidentiality, and all of that stuff. Well, we have oh, actually I know I have a question on yeah. the domicile. Uh -huh. Define it for me. How do you define the domicile of the client? Domicile is an important concept. Concept. Why? It's generally domicile is a determination for a state or inheritance, not necessarily um, residence. This applies both the US, UK, and other places, right? Remember, remember the, the, the green card test? Mm -hmm. That's an yeah. income tax concept, mm -hmm. right? You could not be an income tax resident and still be a domiciliary for US purposes for state tax purposes. Same thing in the UK. Domiciliary is generally based upon facts and circumstances. No hard, fast rule, right? Where do you live? Where do you spend more of your time? Where do you have your driver's license? Where are your kids in school? Yeah. All of these factors of life are domicile. So you could spend less than 121 days in the United States and still be domiciled. Why? Because that's where your kids are in school. That's where your primary residence is, because you travel a lot. Mm -hmm. Right? You can turn that. You don't have to spend the most days for it to be your domicile. Where you have your account, where your job is, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All the 
those factors. Is that usually contested? And it's a balance. Because yeah. if you change your dumbness up. Anything that's facts and circumstances is always contested. Why? Let's go back to the very beginning. What does the judiciary do? Interpret. It interprets laws based upon history and the facts. And whenever your determination is based on the facts, you're subject to challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So people with second homes in Exuma can, cannot really say that they're domiciled in Exuma. That's right. That's right. Because exactly. they span up to six months in Exuma. It's a hard and fast rule on that. I mean, what's your? There's no hard and fast rule. So what's your What's your recommendation? So, so, so let me let me say, I'm a, I'm a rich fellow, right? I got my own plane. Right. I'm from Brazil. I got businesses all over. I spend I spend 80 days in the U.S. I spend 100 days in Brazil. I spend 110 days in the Bahamas of U.S. Brazil Bahamas. What's that? 280. 90. And what, 70 days, 75 days, that gives me 365, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the UK, right? For income tax purposes, where am I resident? Um, probably. But I'm definitely not here, here, or here. Mm -hmm. So it don't really matter, mm -hmm. right? But, My operating bank account is in the UK. My kids are in school in the UK. The only place I have a car is the UK. And I own a home in the UK where I keep all of my you know, personal stuff. And the Bahamas home is just on the beach. Right. Where's my domicile? But I've spent in the fewest amount of days there. Where am I going to pay inheritance tax? In the UK. That's domicile. You get a question on domicile, you can just balance the fact. This is multiple choice, right? Is it multiple choice? Multiple choice. Multiple choice. Multiple choice. It must be high. We must all be together. Madeline can say. We all must get along to get our friends over the parents. Any any questions on entities? I see she did captive insurance, limited partnerships, IBCs. Um, I'm just looking at her slides. Who oh, captive insurance quick? I think that's an error resurgence, uh, an interest that the government has in that now. We are, we are up oh, about, over the last two years, about 30% a year number of captain insurance registrations in the world. So you're catching up with Bermuda? Over here. Huh? Catching up with Bermuda? We are now the 24th jurisdiction in the world in number of captains. Three years ago, we were not on it. Woohoo! Okay. Who did all that play for? That one must have been the person that was there for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> what is captive insurance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Three eyes and <laughs> Captive insurance is generally a self-insurance vehicle. Self-insurance? Generally a self-insurance vehicle. Although you should probably didn't go into this detail, it could be either a standalone IBC or it could be part of a segregated account company. Right? She probably didn't go through it, so I'm not going to go through that. So what do you do? You essentially have your captive insurance here, right? And generally, it would be for business and the entrepreneurs who have a business. So say I have a business here. Say my business has a whole bunch of different types of insurance, right? Employee comp, right? Say I have a fleet of cars and I pay um, auto, right? I have real estate, so I pay on my real estate. I say I have, um, do you know? Right, indemnity? Right? 
these are all insurances that I pay commercially, right? What I could do, instead of paying this all to Lloyd's, right? I could pay it to myself. These are all deductible expenses in a business, right? Well, I do the actuaries and the likely loss and the historical analysis, all substance, all proper insurance, right? And instead of paying it to Lloyd's, I pay the premiums into a captive insurance, a self-insurance vehicle. It's still legitimately insurance, so it's still deductible. So I still get deduction, right? Except now I, so I own the company, and I own whether through a structure or something, I'm still the BO of the captain, right? So say I'm paying a million dollars a year in insurance and premiums, I can instead put that in here, right? I could also figure out if I'm under insured here as a commercial point of view and actually put maybe 1.5 million in here because now there's an incentive to overpay. Here there's not an incentive to overpay. Here there could be an incentive to overpay. Right? Go ahead. You're paying yourself. You're paying yourself. And you're paying yourself. And you invest in it. So. And, uh, and you'll make sure that all your employees are. So if you actually right? have a claim, you pay the claim out of the capital insurance? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. That's right. So a, a smart person will say, which one of these do I usually claim against? The claims against? Employee comp. Employee comp and auto, probably, right? So what does my captive insurance do? I go back out to Lloyd's and buy the policy to ensure that so I don't have to worry about oh. risk of loss, right? So let's say that is a, a million dollars of it, right? Mm -hmm. This stuff that I don't really claim on, I put in here. And so I am now managing a half a million dollars as a wealth management vehicle. Mm -hmm. Defer on the gain. Right? You get deferral. What does deferral give you? It gives you that. Right? I also get the deduction on this side. So I get a double tax benefit. I keep the deduction on this side, I keep the deferral on this side. And I'm not getting no claims. So this is just a wealth management vehicle disguised as an insurance product. Boy, that's how capital it takes a very smart person to think of it. Tax driven. Deduction on one side, deferral on the other. Right? That's the best of both worlds. That's the best of both worlds. And as long as I protect myself on the claims, I'm in good shape. If I don't properly protect, you could go bankrupt here. Right? You go bankrupt here. So one of the claims that you usually, like you said, you would insure the ones. So you look at the claims, and you buy secondary insurance usually on those that, that have frequency of claims. Right. So ones where you say you get, uh, you can make a claim on, on the one you usually don't. You, I mean, what, real estate, what do you get, hurricanes? Yeah. Okay, man. Back, but you would pay, But you would pay it out of the captive. That would pay out of the captive. Right? And remember, this is annual. So every year you're putting another half a million dollars in your management vehicle because you're paying insurance annually, not one time. The premiums are paid annually. So this grows quickly because it grows every year by capital and it grows by deferral. So this could grow really quickly depending on your return because it's compounded plus it's additional capital. Any last minute questions? Sure. We had a question from one of our lecturers as to whether NIB was a tax. NIB is not or an insurance scheme. Well, it depends on how it's structured, right? It could be, it could be structured um, because there's a cap. It's really not a tax, right? It, it, what is it? Four hundred dollars or something? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, but, but it, you know, so it's not really a tax. It, I mean, it's more of a fee or an insurance premium. No, a fee for being employed. It's a premium. A fee. So, so it's really because it's a premium. It's insurance premium. 
No, 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 right. So, because I mean, you're employed. Like, like insurance. insurance. If I pay premium, no, I, mean, like, I never claim, I don't get the benefits. No, from but you put health insurance and I kept insurance. Yeah. 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 What I meant is like how he gave the well, example. My recommendation to cap to, to cap it on NHS. Still working. Yeah. Yeah. Was if I die not this whole way of working if I have an insurance. Do it in a cap. Why? Because health insurance in the public sector alone. Hundred million dollars a year that the government pays. In the public sector alone, it's a hundred million dollars, right? Well, so we should do any That was my recommendation. Because then, and then you can you can do the same thing. You can figure out what components of it, based upon your claim history of the country, you have the statistics. Are most claimed against you by secondary insurance on that? And then you build up your reserves on an event on, as managed. E even if you just take out the government premiums of $100 million, you know, some dollars. Wow. You need a, a legitimate third party investment manager to do that, right? I mean, you need an objective. Properly actuary, proper claim histories, everything else. But you can do it. You can do it. Any other last any questions? No? You all still have my email? I look, I didn't get your email. I think you sent it to the wrong person. Check it out, check it out. Arthur Jr., that's right. Check it out. I think as we read more, you'll see more in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as we really read. This is review theater. It was kind of like right after the So, class. do you think that you're not coming back? There's no more? There was a lot of viewing you could have done and not theory. No problem. You all have a month to study. I know, but I just don't You can't have one more. Food time. You've got to ask. Miss Alice. Five o'clock, three o'clock. I get along, you ask me to teach one. Three weeks. Okay, read the people are asking you to teach another. You ask me, go. He's the boss. Oh, why do you write a petition? Huh? We'll, we'll, we'll send him a petition. You'll send him a petition? Yeah. Right, right there. Right there. After we have read and digest. What you, should, what you should do is you should do a last review session with specific questions. Yeah. Okay. Take the next two weeks to review. Yeah, that's what I mean. Write out specific questions. And then you Right? And then you got to talk to Miguel. <laughs> I don't control that. I'll get past it fast. I'll get past it fast. Of course he wants to pass it I'm going to go into Brazil. I got to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's move on. 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 Let
that then continue? And then uh, it helps you with studying too, because when you go through the material, you're looking at finding things which you didn't know there. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. I'm 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 sorry. I